Good morning, everyone. If you would collect your thoughts and pause your conversations, this is a very low mic, um, we're going to get started this morning. So uh, this morning, we are talking about STEAM. Now, if you were here last night or tuned in for the live stream, um, this is a generative dialogue uh, conference that we're having. It's, there's no pre-scripted presentations. There's nothing like that. The goal of this conference is to really evolve a conversation over the course of three days. We're on day two now. We have a very full day, so we'll have lots of conversations to evolve. But this morning, we're going to talk about STEAM and the future of education. So for those of you who don't know what STEAM is, it stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, Art, Math. The idea is that it's kind of this well-rounded, holistic approach to education where students aren't just siloed into one discipline or another, but they understand how disciplines are related to each other, can help each other, work with each other. Um, and it's a new educational movement. It was started in 2008 after there was a lot of buzz about STEM, um, which came from our government wanting people to go into to STEM so we could have the competitive edge in um, our 21st century space races. Uh, but STEAM is, is adding the art in there. It's adding the design and the humanities. And I think all of us in this room pretty much agree that's important to some degree. So this morning, um, we have five experts in various uh, facets of STEAM education and remodeling education in this 21st century. I will be filling in for my colleague Narav Patel, who I work with at Rutgers, so I'll be talking about what Rutgers is doing in this vein. Um, and I will hand it over to Zach to do the rest of the introductions. So if each participant could raise their hand as I call their name so that our viewers online will know who you are. First, we have Roger Molina. Roger Molina is an art science researcher, space scientist, and astronomer, and editor of Leonardo. Tara Rhoda. Tara? Tara is the manager of the Bio Art Lab at the School of Visual Arts and a practicing artist. As Julia mentioned, filling in for Nirav Patel is Julia Buntain, founder of Sci Art Center. Elizabeth Waters. Elizabeth is a democracy and knowledge consultant and educator at Inquiring Minds USA. Alana Quinn. Alana is an exhibit and program organizer at the cultural program at the National Academy of Sciences. And Tyler Aiello. Tyler is co-founder of Eurekis, an artist and an award-winning STEAM specialist. With that, let's begin the conversation. OK, so um, I, I wanted to start off by asking my colleague, Roger. Uh, we, we've talked for a number of times about STEAM education. Um, how, do we, how do we build a model for it? Um, is there one curriculum? Are there multiple curriculums? Um, so I'll get to my question to you in a second. But to kind of ex explain my role here, in addition to my work with SciArt, I am an adjunct. Um, innovator in residence at Rutgers University. They made up that title for me. I don't, I still don't know what it means, although I've had it for a little while now. But basically my role is to drum up cross-disciplinary activity on campus. I teach a January STEAM course. Um, but when I started teaching this class, I went to uh, make the syllabus. And then as soon as I sat down, I realized, gee, how do I do this? Not make the syllabus part. I know how to do that. But how do I make a syllabus for something that doesn't have a roadmap to it? It's not an English class where you read X amount of books and you write X amount of essays. It's really kind of uncharted territory. So I started to reach out to other people, including a lot of people in this room and Roger, saying, OK, like what, what's your STEAM syllabus look like? What, what are the goals of a STEAM class? Uh, how do you teach someone in a cross-disciplinary manner for an 11-day class like mine or for a four-month class like a regular semester? Um, so that's when I got started with this conversation about a year and a half ago. And I realized that 
every person involved in STEAM kind of has their own approach. They're all very like-minded, but um, part of the reason I wanted to talk about this this morning was that so we could kind of come together and continue nailing down like we were last night with collaboration, you know, what are the goals and, and maybe how do we define it better so that we can all do better in our own work? Um, so I know that you've had a lot of thoughts about this, Roger, especially when it comes to educating cross-disciplinary people, um, especially at the graduate level. Um, so if you want to speak to that a little bit, I'd love to hear more. Okay, so l let me just begin with a, a little bit of context. Um, so I was born of an English mother and a Texan father in Paris. So I come from a very hybrid cultural background, um, which I, th I know affects my thinking. Um, second thing is I worked uh, for 30, 40 years as an astrophysicist, uh, building telescopes to put on satellites. I've experienced the thrill of discovery, uh, and so I've had the joyful experience of discovering things that people didn't know before. Um, in parallel with that, um, as was mentioned, I'm the executive editor of a number of publications at, at MIT Press called the Leonardo Publications, which seek to document and advocate the work of all our discussion, um, and we're now celebrating our 50th anniversary. Um, five years ago, I was forced to retire in France uh, because in France there's a mandatory retirement age in the universities of 65. <laughs> and I got this incredible offer in Dallas to open an art science lab, um, funded by a rich Texan uh, with all the implications that comes with, um, although they don't meddle uh, in what I'm doing. Uh, and I have true academic freedom, which is slightly frightening today when we look at the state of education in general. <laughs> um, my teaching contract says I will teach one course a semester to graduate students on a topic of my choice, and that's in writing. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I've never taught the same thing twice. Um, why my seminars are typically a dozen uh, students. And w what's fascinating and exciting is that the students come from very different disciplinary backgrounds. So in the seminar this year, I have someone who's working on our Center for Brain Health, working on games for autistic children. <laughs> um, I'm working with um, a young man who's in GIS, Geographic Information Systems, and he's been scanning buildings on the campus before they're pulled down and making holograms of them. <laughs> uh, I have students uh, that are uh, art students, um, but are using new ways of expressing themselves. So uh, let me tell you, it's really difficult to figure out what it is we want to teach or what we think people should learn. And I think one of the problems I have is I think um, universities have reached the limit of their usefulness because they try to teach for the normal student. And let me tell you, none of the students in my seminar are normal. Um, they, they all have hybrid interests, multiple interests. Um, you know, I was a narrow astronomer for 30 years, and let me tell you, I did astronomy 24 hours a day and night. Um, they, they all are trying to figure out how the university is going to help them do a career that mixes their hybrid interests. And universities just don't think that way. So I think the future of STEM education is outside of the university. Well, it's interesting you're, you're, kind of, you're saying that um, student demand is, is causing a change in ed education, or at least maybe that's part of it. And I definitely experience the same with my students, and I'm, I'm sure that you guys do too, where they're just not satisfied with, I don't know, maybe the way we went to school, where you just kind of focus in on one thing. Um, Tara, uh, so you uh, um, run a really amazing lab that, I was a student at SVA, so I had the pleasure of meeting Tara as the lab manager at SVA. Can you talk a bit about what's going on there? Sure. Um, I think uh, uh, maybe what sets it apart uh, 
ordinarily when we think about STEM, we think about integri uh, bring, bringing the arts uh, into science and technology and engineering and math. Uh, but in our lab, uh, uh, it's a bio art lab at the School of Visual Arts. Um, it was founded in 2011 by Suzanne Anker. We essentially do the reverse. We put uh, the STEM toolbox in the hands of art students. Um, and our curriculum is project-based learning, uh, so we tend to work backwards. Uh, we put it in their hands and then follow their curiosity and sort of untangle uh, the logistics to lay some more formal and technical groundwork. Um, and they uh, sort of get a crash course in all things uh, biology. A lot of it is material oriented. So we work with a lot of organisms that have image and mold making capabilities. Uh, so they paint with bacteria and grow sculptures out of uh, mushrooms and bacterial cellulose. Um, they do a lot of uh, food transformations and uh, work quite a bit with DNA um, and a bit of uh, plant modification. Um, so it's a, a spectrum. Um, and for the most part, they're all undergraduate art students that have little to no background in the sciences. Uh, so they're really coming in uh, sort of as a blank slate. And we definitely see that shift throughout the semester. You know, they, they uh, approached the lab initially and it's sort of a sterile facility uh, and what feels like an academic field that they don't belong to. Uh, but within a few weeks, uh, they've uh, figured out how to navigate the space and they uh, start approaching it as they would any of their other studio facilities. Um, so they come in and they can uh, manipulate and shape life um, and get a more personal grasp on uh, uh, some of the advancements in biotechnology and um, explore their concerns about the biological world. Um, so for the most part, um, it is a project-based uh, material-oriented studio facility, um, but it is a, it's a spectrum. Uh, so uh, on the other end, uh, as um, a group, we often collaborate on longer-term, more academic projects as well. Um, but for the most part, we function as a studio space. Um, I, I wonder, like, how, uh, what's your experience with these kind of typical art school students who come in um, and all of a sudden they're immersed in science? I mean, I think, uh, and that's sort of how we shaped our curriculum. Um, Immediately, when you put something in front of an artist, they want to start manipulating it. They don't want to know all of the details. They want to dive in. Um, and so we've accommodated that. Um, we've figured out how to uh, restructure uh, ordinary workshops or uh, <coughs> educational seminars in a way in which they get hooked and invested. and. Uh, and then we can sort of follow their concerns and unravel that. Um, but I would say uh, they are uh, boundless. They have no hesitation, uh, endless questions, and uh, no desire to follow any of the rules. Uh, as <laughs> lab manager, it makes it a little tricky for me. Uh, I tend to be the naysayer. Um, as an artist running in a bio lab, uh, we definitely follow the rules forwards and backwards. So I think one of the things that's really hard for an art student uh, or someone that's not familiar with a laboratory space is to recognize the difference in context. Uh, so a lot of times when we're talking about cultures or contamination, um, you know, we'll say a moldy uh, loaf of bread in your dorm room is a few missed sandwiches, but in the bio lab, it's you know a hazard and it has to be terminated immediately. So I think for them, some of these uh, uh, very contextual differences about even things that they encounter in their domestic day-to-day uh, uh, -day lives are quite interesting for them. Um, what, what about you, Tyler, working with younger students in this field? So we also are doing project-based learning, but a lot of what we're doing is trying to teach different types of literacy. <clears throat> and I would say over the last year, year and a half, really the focus has been more on an engineering literacy as um, people are trying to reintroduce kind of a, 
and redefine vocational training, mostly around computer technology, 3D modeling, printers, and things like that. Schools are investing a lot into these labs, but they don't have the projects to actually do anything with them, or the knowledge, and so, some of that knowledge takes years to acquire. So really what we're trying to do from a very early age, and we do work all the way th through with college students and even adult learners, um, is to develop projects that are teaching different skill sets, um, whether it's engineering, but also the vocabulary that goes with it, to be able to problem solve, um, use your creativity, and children especially are like artists, um, you know, they're not bound by anything, they have lots of questions, um, don't really care about the answers necessarily to begin with, what they're interested in is exploring and then figuring out why something doesn't work and then going back and maybe fixing it so it does work. Um, and so a lot of times what we're talking about too when we're going in and training teachers is developing tools for the teachers to be able to change um, the context, the subject matter. Um, the subject matter becomes kind of the inspiration for the students. Um, all learners learn in different ways, some visually, some tactile. Um, and so by developing these projects that are truly kind of transdisciplinary, you're able to also um, bring out the strengths in different learners, if that makes sense, because so often in schools, um, you know, with our data-driven kind of models that we have, it's really based more on the tests. Um, reading, writing, math, um, science is not really high, highly valued either, so what kids are getting is, you know, you don't get really chemistry until you're in middle or high school, and you only get kind of a certain type of chemistry where I remember going to school as a kid and you were constantly getting bits of information to the point where maybe by high school you were figuring out what your passions were and what you were good at so by the time you got to college you could focus a little bit more directly on something. Okay, so my, my burning question of the day, and I, I know that early of the hour, um, and I know you guys have your own too, is it, is it possible to develop a standard STEAM curriculum? Is that something we should do? I would say no. Um, Why? <laughs> I, I think as, as we work, and we work from the West Coast to the East Coast, um, all age learners, is that really people are so driven by the tests and you go into schools, um, teachers don't have the freedom anymore to develop lesson plans that are able to transfer knowledge to students. Every year there's a new set of standards that they're trying to deal with and there's these assessments and really kids from an early age are being taught that there's a wrong, right and a wrong way to do things. Um, and I think that bringing the arts back into STEM, um, you know, and really expanding on that definition of what art is, gives learners of all ages that opportunity to say there is no right or wrong. This is really more about play, it's more about um, expressing my interests, learning more about my interests, doing the research, um, and it doesn't have to be right or wrong. Um, and then you can carry that over, and I think this is where some of that transdisciplinary conversation was going last night, is that um, through that freedom, then you can kind of focus in on the science of it or other aspects of it, but to give people the space to be creative without the right or the wrong. Um, and so by putting standards to it, um, I think it would kind of mess up what's going on with, with the movement as a whole. I definitely agree, but I also just totally disagree. And I <laughs> 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 Because I, I think like a lot of us here, we want to see STEAM, like educators want to see STEAM take off and be implemented. How do you implement something without a blueprint? How do you teach someone who's not a STEAM educator to be one? Let me just mention, um, we're just finishing a project right now. Um, I was just discussing with Javier how in the Beltway they want evidence that STEAM is a good thing. <laughs> And they only accept certain kinds of evidence, uh, and you know, test scores <laughs> is obviously part of that landscape. Um, so one of the things that um, Peter West and Aldecina 
articulated was, well, can you give me really good examples of what STEM involves, mm. STEAM involves? Just give me 20 really good uh, examples that you could explain to a congressperson. <laughs> and so I've been working with a PhD student now for a year <laughs> with about 20 nominators. And it's, it's such a diverse landscape of what people are doing. So it's not like there is a STEAM example that's the example. There are about 20, well, we have 20 right now. But each one of you probably would come up with 20 different, maybe overlapping examples of why we're so excited about uh, what's going on and why we think uh, school systems uh, should pay attention. Um, and the trouble is our, our systems are uncomfortable with that ambiguity, as, as Harvey was saying to me, um, where, as you say, it's, the right, it's not a right or wrong answer. It's a process that might lead you to somewhere where you couldn't have gone otherwise. And um, school systems hate that. I mean, it, it's really a very difficult problem. I never heard about STEAM until I met Julia, so I know very little about it. So if I'm going to say anything or ask question that I'm, it, it's stupid, I apologize beforehand. But what I'm not clear about is one, when does this STEAM education begin? Second is, what is the goal of this education? And three, has it been gone on long enough for you to be able to say, this is what happens when somebody goes through this STEAM programs. What is, what is it they do when a 30-year-old has gone through this whole program? What is he doing? And how is that, being through that education, has made him different from somebody like me who never went through that education? So, well, well I was, yes, I was going to say, I think the thing that the question I have for other people is, in your examples of what STEAM education looks like, what is the relative balance of practices versus content? Um, my background is as a neuroscientist, I'm interested in development and memory and hormones and moving into education. And what I love most about changes in science education are the discussions that happen around the next generation science standards because it's multidimensional. And one very important part of that is practices. And certainly in the work that I do in elementary education now, we're talking about how do you practice curiosity? How do you practice creativity? There's a lot of mythology that surrounds those things. It's actually things you do, not as a person, not your the things you make. Um, so I think that what a STEAM uh, student would look like as a 30-year-old or a 40-year-old, someone coming out of an educational system would be somebody who's confident in their ability to explore their world and identify questions and generate solutions for themselves um, and then discuss it with other people. Like I think those are the four core things for me. But don't we already have a lot of people who are like that? Uh, well, a lot of I, I, maybe the audience. I, I, I see some furrowed brows in the audience. I'm not sure. I think internally, but I, there is something reinforcing uh, uh, about getting someone to the table that feels less than qualified. I, I don't know much about stereotype threat, but I get the impression that um, it is a way to get people involved. Uh, I know with our art students, uh, they have no hesitation uh, to make art. And if they were to sit down and be asked to do a, a research or a science experiment, there would be great aversion. Uh, but when we set it on the table as art, before they know it, they've done science. And they feel a lot more um, capable, not only as an individual, but as a maker. And I think them being able to demystify some of the technical aspects about their biological world um, gives them a more intimate understanding and even a sense of authority, which is really empowering. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and also importantly, uh, you know, the, the people who go through STEAM education, um, 
they're not going to grow up to be prejudiced about art or science or technology or engineering or math or literature. You know, these are people who are going to understand and equally value all of the disciplines that we have. And I, I think that's the real difference. Um, and and that, that creates a situation where, uh, say, say someone has a STEAM education, but they grow up to be... Um, you know, a mathematician. Um, it, it means that they might uh, they might be more open to collaborating, like we were talking about last night, to solve a problem. Um, or, or you know, it might mean that they just run in social circles that are outside of their own discipline. I mean, STEAM has this really. It, it's hard to define, and the reason that we are kind of skirting around it is because there's not one definition, there's not one curriculum, but but it, it's a whole whole bodied mindset. Let me just jump in to try and... So this discussion is not old. Not new, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's very old. It's very old. It's at least 100,000 years old. And so there were hunters and gatherers. <laughs> and probably the hunters got trained to hunt and the mm -hmm. gatherers got trained to gather. <laughs> but then occasionally there were a few people that did both and they learned things in hunting that really helped the gathering. <laughs> um, and so I think one of the problems is our school systems have gotten so narrow that that fluidity between different ways of knowing, mm -hmm. of doing, um, you know, in the Middle Ages you were either making, you know, you were a, horse, a shoemaker or a, a horseshoe maker, uh, and mm -hmm. you had to decide which guild you were in. There was the guild of uh, shoemakers and the guild of, but what, what happened then is these uh, academies appeared that bridged the guilds, <laughs> right? And so the, the early academies was an effort to, to do that. In the last century, we had holistic studies, inter, integrative studies, interdisciplinary studies. So roughly every generation there's a group of people that feels that the system is keeping the hybrids or the osmosis between the disciplines from really happening. So I, th I think STEAM is a new expression of that very long um, need uh, to, to, so that people both learn and teach in ways which allow that lateral transfer. Over the last uh, 15, 20 years, I've been actively involved in creating interdisciplinary meetings here. And so I'm, and as a result of that, I have learned a tremendous amount, and it has opened my eyes to a lot of things that before in my narrow discipline, I couldn't uh, look at, think about, and use it to improve my own understanding, including within my own discipline. So that has been an interdisciplinary conversation that I've assisted and has helped. But I have a sense that what you mean by STEAM and STEAM education is something a lot more structured and concrete than just, you know, hanging around with people from different disciplines and talking to them. So that's what my question was about. So if I could... Therefore, where we go with it. If I could talk a little bit about um, the relevancy and, and what a student would look like getting out of school at 30. Um, Monica and I oftentimes are asked to go into at-risk schools um, and work with students. So a couple years ago, we developed a whole um, suite of projects around simple machines, which in Common Core standards, kids get in second, third grade. Um, about 40% English language learners. Um, they were probably rated about 60% proficiency. They were probably right around that with attendance rating. <clears throat> we were working with a science teacher. And over the course of a semester working with um, second and third graders, you know, in those communities, oftentimes the kids don't have a lot of time with their parents, and so there's, there's great gaps in where these students are coming into school, too. And by the end of the semester, we had gone um, 
you know, from these very low ratings um, to 96% attendance rating, about 87% proficiency rating. And a lot of this was based on the fact that, one, we're working with English language learners, um, but two, through these projects that we developed, we're doing things like storyboarding templates um, and automata theater boxes. So the kids are having to develop characters, they're having to develop story outlines, and then they're actually having to do the engineering and put together these boxes so that they can crank their toys. Um, and again, so this is very transdisciplinary, but what you start seeing at an early age is that all kids excel at different levels and that confidence that they get from seeing how somebody who might not excel at reading and writing is now excelling at engineering um, and so you're also starting to get kids in an early age to start working together um, but I would say also since we've been doing this long enough we've had students in our programs for four or five years and oftentimes what we see is this intuitive understanding that they start to get of these subject matters and I think this is where the conversation was going last night a little bit too is that Artists are very intuitive about the world. When you think about the golden section, um, you know, artists were using this long before scientists, philosophers actually put the math to it to decipher what it was. Jackson Pollock paintings, um, you know, later now that we have the technology, um, you know, explore fractal design and theory. Um, I'm sure he did not know what he was doing, and I don't even think they were talking about fractals back then, right? Um, but so this intuitive understanding of the world is something that we really have gotten away from because we've become so specialized in our fields and the way that we teach subjects and um, apply it in education that what we're not allowing kids to do from an early age is start to develop that intuitive understanding of the world that they live in um, and to really start figuring out what they excel at um, so that that becomes kind of their focus in life. Yeah, so this is happening at all educational levels, and there are definitely different approaches depending like what age you're teaching. Um, I'm going to ask Alana to jump in here because she is graciously filling in for a colleague of hers from the National Academy of Sciences. Um, and, and you can kind of describe the effort that's been going on at the NAS in terms of uh, identifying the STEAM landscape. Sure. So. Um there is a lot of anecdotal evidence about um, the benefits of a STEAM or STEAM education to include the humanities. Um, <laughs> First time I've heard that one. Oh, really? <laughs> so the, um, the academy has decided to undertake a two-year study on evidence of the value of integrating um, arts and humanities into STEM education, specifically at the undergraduate and graduate level. And the study looks at different programs throughout the US, and um, the, the findings will actually be published this coming spring. So. <laughs> They're not ready to talk about it yet. <laughs> yeah, but it looks at a variety of programs, like at, um, I think ASU has a lot of very integrated programs. Olin College of Engineering has um, a few program, a few courses that combine different disciplines. So it's really looking at a variety of these programs and will set forth a uh, a resource for best practices. So if you were a professor at a university and you were interested in getting involved in this field, how might you go about it? This could be a good resource. And, and are they still accepting uh, submissions? You know, For evidence? Yeah. Or, no, I think that ended in May. Okay. So they're kind of wrapping up the study at this point. But yeah, that's, yeah. Um, it's been going on for a little while. I'm really looking forward to see what they come up with. <laughs> Me too, yeah. I'd like to say I do think the humanities are an important part of it. When, when we talk about the A in STEAM, um, so much of what we're doing is actually putting in that historical and cultural context. Um, you know, it's very easy to take current technology and take it back 5,000 years to see how that thought process um, has evolved. And it's also something kids get excited about because, um, as kids like to say, any time before cell phones was the dark ages. <laughs> I'm glad you just brought that up because I, despite the fact that I'm a STEAM practitioner, I like really hate the acronym. Um, I mean, it's catchy. You can say funny things like, is STEAM just a bunch of hot air? 
<laughs> which uh, I don't know if we ever settled on that one. No, we didn't. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, the acronym leaves out <laughs> humanities. Like, the arts are not the humanities. And, and maybe it's a disservice to talk about it that way. So is there another word for STEAM? Like, what's the next gen? I think redefining how we think of art is really um, a better conversation. Because really, when you think about what is art, what ends up, and the annals of history, um, it's really what's um, important as a cultural significance. Um, you know, that knowledge at the time, the technology, whatever it is, that's really what you're learning about when you're learning about art history and culture. We recently had a group of children uh, tour the lab that were from uh, PS, I believe, 92, uh, and a handful of other uh, STEAM uh, programs will come to check out the lab, and more than once, uh, we've been showing them around, maybe uh, you know, feeding a Venus flytrap some fingernail clippings or mm. uh, another task of sorts. And I kept hearing the children say to each other, that's so steamy. Um, and they were using it as an adjective. And at first I was like, okay, I'm officially old. That sounds cool, but I have no idea what it means. And then, and this was maybe two years ago before STEAM was uh, an acronym that I was very familiar with. And then it clicked. That's the way that they were referring to a spectrum of all things awesome. Um, and for them, it was hype. It was cool. Um, and <laughs> steamy sounds pretty good. I don't know. <laughs> All things awesome. Yeah. I like that. Was Black Mountain College an early version of this? Yeah. Because there are many artists who came out of there, uh, Dorothy Rockburn, and so who, who studied mathematics, studied art. Yeah. Let me just jump in. <clears throat> so I think the way we're phrasing the question is part of the problem. Um, and we get into the subject of taxonomies, uh, science, humanities, engineering, math. Um, that's not how the world is organized, right? This table doesn't mm. care what <laughs> discipline you come from. <laughs> um, and so um, and the problem is we have trouble with fuzzy taxonomies. Uh, universities hate them because you kind of have a department of fuzzy things. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and so I, I think part of the challenge, you know, as you said, Blackman, there have been hundreds, thousands of places that have done what we're talking about over, over the centuries. Um, and so how, how do we think differently about what we're trying to do? Um, when I got to Dallas, I got exposed to and I'm, my close collaborator is Cassini Nazir, who's a design professor. <laughs> and you know, I'm a scientist, I'm an engineer, I've designed things. <laughs> but let me tell you, my idea of design was so narrow. <laughs> so he says, OK, and, and this is part of some of the design vocabulary. So what is the social outcome you're trying to achieve through what you're doing? Become rich and famous, uh, make a better world, find someone to marry, have a family. I mean, depending on the social outcome, you, you need to approach it differently. So what is the social outcome you're trying to achieve? Then the next step is, how do you organize a group of people to achieve that social outcome? How do you design the group? If you can do it by yourself, go do it by yourself, goddammit. <laughs> but if you need a group of people with different skills and so on, then design the group that way to achieve, to try and achieve your social outcome. Next level down, well then design the services that group needs in order to work to achieve that social outcome. And then at the bottom of the list is products. <laughs> so maybe you do, you need a, do need a cell phone <laughs> to achieve that social outcome. And let me tell you, in my physics engineering education, I never thought that way. And if you think that way, the humanities is not something outside of the problem. It's mm -hmm. inside the problem. <laughs> and I think this whole thing of steam, steam, uh, heat in England, humanities, engineering, art, technology, <laughs> there's no heat without steam. No <laughs> steam without steam. <laughs> uh, I think the problem is we're thinking in a way that people have thought in universities, in my case, for 200 years mm -hmm. now, and that we need to find a different way of articulating the, the problem. So yeah, we need 100,000 Black Mountain Colleges, 
but how do you organize that to happen uh, in structures that want test scores, <laughs> that want departmental structures, that, uh, and that's why I, I, deep inside me, and I hope my provost is not listening, <laughs> I'm not sure that university is the right place because it's organized in a way that's antagonistic to the very idea that we're talking about. Yeah. I sometimes feel that adults are not even the right place to start. It's all very top-down. We're designing for our world. Um, in Inquiring Minds, we work in elementary schools, um, offering students the opportunity to participate in the process to decide how they want their school to be a better place. Um, what's interesting is they really know each other. They know each other's strengths and weaknesses. Um, and they also know what they want for themselves and each other. And so one thing that we use a lot are learning walls where students can um, address an essential question that's important to the test they have to take someday, but they can use it to practice thinking and practice collaborating. And for us, it's really looking at something bigger, that sort of their future. They're, we live in a democracy. They need to be prepared to not only recognize their own individual opinion, but also to participate in the group, towards group goals. Um, and so they'll put up their uh, ideas about the essential questions, and then they'll start making connections. So our, oh, you said, if I ask what is my, how is my school like a community? You said, well, our school's like a community because every room is a different group of people. And we're all doing different things, but we're all working together. And then somebody else will say, well, it, within our room, we are a community because we come from different places with different ideas. And so they can take an idea that is science related or math related or humanities related or art related and bring it into that space. I think if every child was taught that way, they wouldn't look like us as adults. They would look very different. Um, and the thing that I think is most powerful for me in that is my concern is maybe not STEM education per se, and I'm a scientist, so again, if anybody's listening, I do really love science. Um, <laughs> but it's the way, it's to really equal the playing field. You can do this in a school with, with absolutely no resources, where their greatest resource is their students. You can do it in a school that has a lot of resources. Their greatest resource is still their students. Um, but we don't teach students that way. Um, and so even taking problem-based education further, sometimes we just need to give space for students to have conversations. Like, we have this opportunity as adults. They don't always have that opportunity as students. Um, and so I, I, I would, again, not, I'm not a fan of STEM or STEAM, although I love a good pun. And a, you know, a joke coming from a scientist is always funny to everyone. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> Uh, I want some sort of higher level name that's more encompassing, that's not, you know, something below the cloud. <laughs> yeah, so I, I feel like this, this acronym problem is something I've been thinking about for a while. Mm -hmm. Everyone's been thinking about it for a while. Maybe by tomorrow we'll have a better idea. Yes. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's ambitious, but it's possible. Because um, we're going to be doing another STEAM panel later on. So. We can, we can see how that evolves. But yeah, everyone put your thinking caps on about that. We need to figure this out. <laughs> There's a term, um, convergence, that I like. Oh. The Academy um, published a, a study about convergence. It was really looking at benefits of bringing different scientific disciplines together. But uh, I think you could also apply arts and humanities into it. And um, it ties in with the idea of uh, transdisciplinarity that we were talking about last night, where um, these different disciplines come together in a really in-depth way, and um, the focus is on solving some kind of problem. So I don't know what you, what you might think of that term. I like that term. Yeah. <laughs> it's part of our conference title. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Let me just come back to the to the the adults are part of the problem. <laughs> um, so 
you know, when I was growing up, there was the Montessori school movement. There were a number of these very different models uh, for elementary education. Mm -hmm. um, and the problem was when you tried to get into mass education, you know, then you get into this thing that everybody's taught as an average person and there's a test score result. So I think part of the complexity, we have plenty of good examples of right. early uh, educational models. Um, how do we generalize those in some way so that it's not just the, the lucky few that are, go to the Montessori school? Well, I would love to see a trickle-up model. I think edu elementary education teachers do a lot of innovative things with pedagogy um, and classroom practices that high school students and university students would benefit from. Um, I mean, when you say that, a couple of really practical things come to mind. I mean, my, I'm a, also a mother. My children went to a ratio school based on play, very self-directed. Um, there are opportunities within school to do that. It will be a little bit harder at later levels, but even within the elementary school, oftentimes, um, because students developmentally are at so many different levels, as you mentioned earlier, and just what experiences they have coming in, they will use, um, during math class, activity stations. And students will go to different activity stations to practice different schools. It'll be individual practice, group practice, one will be an art space practice. Um, couldn't that, instead, the stations be, this one is a humanities, this one is an art, like, make them more directed um, to each of that and still have it be around one core question. I think at the university level, this is something that could happen in an in open lab like yours, um, but maybe needs to be taken into that intro biology class. And it's not, um, it's not happening in that many places. But I would love to see sort of that trickle up from the idea of Montessori. Nice. So just picking up on your trickle, trickle up thing. So, you know, we're also in a world where we talk about formal education, informal education, and what's the third called? Uh, <laughs> lifelong learning or something, <laughs> continuing education, right? Well, from the trickle-up point of view, we do believe in lifelong learning, right? So even in the workplace, <laughs> somehow what you're talking about should be happening, right? And it's not as easy as a company buying a design company to inject mm. creativity into the company, which a lot of companies are doing, which is wonderful. But so how does this way of problem-driven um, work actually permeate the whole culture um, and not just formal education. Um, so I, how do we do trickle up? Uh, <laughs> I'd like to defer to someone else. <laughs> I, um, I, the class that I teach, as I mentioned, it's a January class and it's the best class because I don't have to grade them, which I, I would just give them all A's if I had to. Um, I don't believe in grading <laughs> for the Hampshire people in the room. Um, but, but also, it's, it's an intensive learning course, and it takes place in no classroom at all. We're in New York City, and we go around to art science lectures, to exhibits that engage design and technology. We meet artists who are painting about the ocean. We meet scientists who are doing public outreach through comedy. So I basically introduce my students to the real world of how cross-disciplinarity works, and then they bring that back to their siloed academia world and try and figure out how to keep that spirit within them. I've only taught the class once. It's a new program at Rutgers. So I have yet to see the long-term outcomes, but I'm very interested in that because if we can't change academia, maybe we can change students and then they can change academia. So what you're doing in your class is basically taking the students out and giving them opportunities to reflect on a variety of subjects they don't have any experience. Like that's design thinking. That's, mm -hmm. the, that's the cycle. Maybe the opportunity to reflect is what will change workplace. I think one of the best models we've actually seen uh, 
scene of um, integrating STEAM, but also taking what would be considered more traditional education, as often in rural places. We work a lot in Wyoming. Um, and what they've done over the years, instead of trying to continually reinvent education, um, they've modified it a little bit, but you still have chemistry, you still have physics, you still have history. Um, you have all of the classes, but then you have a computer lab where they're learning about programming, they're learning to operate programs um, like the Microsoft or Adobe products. But then they have a synthesizing center, which is their STEAM lab. So you take all of this knowledge you're getting from all of these different classes, um, and you have a place to synthesize that information and work with it creatively. You mentioned plasticity before. Is the indication that in a certain way, the generation that will go through this kind of education will just be have a different brain, will think differently, their brain would work differently, the associations they make would be different, and so, in a way, you can't really tell what the outcome would be long term because you are modifying the whole way of thinking. And so, uh, for instance, he really cannot become any more esteem, uh, result of steam, <laughs> because he was, his brain was formed the way my brain was formed, where we had all these individual mm -hmm. subjects. This is a different ambition, a well, different outcome. I agree with you, the brains of the young people today are going to be different than our brains. That's always been the case, um, because new, new ex each generation has new experiences. You know, and, but I disagree that we can't change his brain. I think we experience lifetime over an entire... <laughs> we experience <laughs> that now is with drugs. <laughs> um, or, or conversation. I mean, we, it's, a, it's a myth. We, as, even as adults, we experience plasticity over our entire lifetime. It, We're never stuck. But, but it's, it's complicated, right? So we still need specialists, right? When I go to the doctor, I want the best educated, focused doctor <laughs> trying to figure out what's going on in my mm -hmm. body. Um, so somehow we've got to mm -hmm. articulate the need for specialists with the need for a culture that thinks across all of that stuff. And uh, it's a difficult problem. Um, but I thought the idea is that that specialist, having gone through this system, would hopefully, while being a specialist, also have a different perspective on the whole nature of the problem. Yeah. I, th I think that what you're talking about, and this is what we see in our younger students, is that maybe you specialize in something, but be because you are exposed to all of these other things, you're not so set in thinking that there's a black and white answer. Um, that there's only one way to think of things, but there's actually multiple ways to think of it. And maybe there's the best way to think of something or to solve a problem. Um, but for any problem we have, there's a thousand different ways of solving that problem. And there's got to be more than one way. Yeah, it's like we were talking last night about, you know, what transdisciplinary actually means. Um, you know, what is something if it comes out of art and science, but it's not art or science? And then I think the STEAM educated people will, will be the ones doing that. Well, and I think it's important, you know, in the future for, because we need specialists and because people have, uh, preferences, which you mentioned before, the idea of some people prefer to learn things visually or by tactile. I think it's important for us all to recognize that we have the ability to understand many things, but we actually choose. Um, we choose, we could all learn equally well visually or tactile, but we choose to pursue it in one primary way. In early education, the goal of educators is to expose students to a lot of different things so that they develop a wide range of skills. It's okay as an adult to choose one, but still recognize that the people around you have also made a choice and that we need an environment that allows people to make as many possible choices so that we have doctors and... Lawyers. Lawyers, okay. Nurses, people. like we, exactly. <laughs> 
scientists, uh, <laughs> artists. I think as people get older, I'm raising two teenage children. Um, and so one of the things that we struggle with constantly is not necessarily criticizing, but trying to get our children to understand that everybody has weaknesses. Um, and you can always go towards the easy thing, which is the thing you excel at. Um, but if you're not constantly working on your weaknesses too, um, you're not a well-rounded person. <clears throat> Go ahead. I, I'd like to take the conversation in a totally different direction, if that's all right. And since we're in a private space with nobody listening. Uh, <laughs> oh, nice no, but it, it, no, it, it, it's being silent, cast. Well, but, okay, we're now in a culture, you know, that how, how do children grow up in that culture where nothing is private? <laughs> um, there's a good steam problem. No, the, the, um, I just want to come back to the, uh, the discussion on humanities. And I, part of me is frightened of what I'm about to talk about. So please uh, tolerate my anxiety. So um, are the humanities inside or outside? <laughs> so I'm working with a group of people led by Ben Schneiderman to organize a conference at the National Academy next March. It's called Revisiting Cybernetic Serendipity. And Jazia Reichert, who organized that famous exhibition in 1968, one of the first museum shows, gallery shows, that really integrated emerging technologies, uh, the, the artists that were doing that. Uh, the conference is funded by the Sackler Foundation. And probably many of you know, uh, the Sackler Foundation made a lot of its money because some of the brothers were involved in the pharmaceutical industry. Um, among other things, they developed the marketing model of using doctors as marketing agents, using direct marketing to uh, patients to tell their doctor what to buy. And our government has now declared a health crisis because of the opioid epidemic. One person on the organizing committee has now resigned because they want to have nothing to do with promoting the reputation of the Sackler Foundation. One of the invited speakers has said they may or may not come. So what is the STEAM way of dealing with this? You know, it's really easy to criticize and say, your money is dirty, my money is clean. <laughs> Well, I don't think we live in that kind of a binary world. So how do we hold a conference, accept the money from the Sackler Foundation, and it's more complicated, Alana, as you, you know, with, once you start looking at it, um, in a way where we think differently of how we might redesign the National Academy of Science, redesign the National Academy of Engineering, redesign the National Academy of Medicine, so the, this thinking about these problems is integrated into science and engineering. Because typically what we do in universities is we give engineers ethics courses. Oh, that's someone else's specialty. It's not my problem. <laughs> so what would be the STEAM approach to think about how you function in the real world where there is money that is less and more clean <laughs> and now, I think what we're trying to do in STEAM is worth supporting, and I'm delighted the Sackler Foundation is willing to support it. So how do we get the humanities inside, and how does a four-year-old or a five-year-old understand the consequences of what they're making? <laughs> so how, how do you teach a five-year-old to think about the consequences of what they're making? I'm going to need some time to think about that. <laughs> <laughs> so, time, I think we have to go to questions. We're going to sit with that one for a little while. Okay, well, let me, I, and I said I was frightened to raise it publicly. But, it's a very interesting problem. But, you know, the humanities got left out of the STEAM acronym. I don't think it was intentional. <laughs> it was mm -hmm. just STEAMy was easier to say <laughs> uh, than STEAMy. <laughs> <laughs> But and I, I think we, we owe it to ourselves to, to address those kinds of issues within the STEAM discussion. Paul?
day, uh, probably had to do with humanity in one way or another. Uh, so that can wait. Uh, I was hoping uh, to raise a question about a difference that you, some of you have adumbrated between the polymath and the transdisciplinarian. People who can do many things, like Leonardo, for example, undoubtedly were benefiting from the ways in which those things informed the other things that they did. Something about the science of human flying may have had something to do with the composition of the Mona Lisa. That's up to the Leonardo expert to decide. Um, but it seems to me, since in some ways, I think STEAM or theme is pointing more toward the transdisciplinary mind. Uh, I just wanted to throw out uh, the interesting example of Parmigianino uh, when, for example, he experimented with what he called the convex mirror and undertook to make a self-portrait in a convex mirror, which involved uh, messing around with what Alberti had very recently established as the fundamental laws of perspective. In other words, even within a discipline, uh, Parmigianino was trying to find ways of complicating uh, received attitudes toward the basis of the discipline. And this involved, uh, uh, as was said last night, seeing things, the same things, in new ways. And that seems to me to be to point toward a transdisciplinary model. Maybe this is just a statement, or maybe it's something that some of the panelists would like to pick up. Thank you. Um, I was going to say, we talk often about the Edison effect in our classroom, um, where if you have 25 kids faced with the same problem, you have 25 solutions to that problem. Um, and everybody's learning from each other, and from those 25 solutions, you have another 25 solutions, because people are now starting to see the problem solved in different ways, and being able to see what works, what doesn't work, and taking from those design models what they think are the best parts of it, and then redesigning. I think you made a very useful distinction, which we should discuss during the day, between polymathy and transdisciplinary. For me, polymathy is indeed in this idea of the genius who is good at many things. Right? And universities are structured to train geniuses. My university counts how many Nobel Prize winners we have. <laughs> Transdisciplinary is a different problem. How do you train a group of people to behave in a way that's genius-like? <laughs> uh, and so that's a team activity. It's transdisciplinary between people. It's not training the individual to be a genius. It's training the group of people to come up with solutions that no, no, no one of them could have done. So let, let, let's keep that polymathy versus transdisciplinary. <laughs> That's very true, but as you say, keep it focused on the group, you're quite yeah. right. Thank you. So, fantastic discussion this morning. Um, I, the, the, the question about goals, actually, why, why, why we're doing this. Um, so there's cross-disciplinary, there's transdisciplinary, there's, there's polymathy. There's, there's lots of ways that, that, that we can approach it. But there was a conference um, <laughs> um, <laughs> Can everyone hear me? Yes, OK. So there, there, was, there was a conference um, earlier this year. Uh, that brought together many of the people that are here. It's called the space between. And I, I love that expression because what it actually refers to is that the, there is this zone, this domain, that lies between, around, among. Um, and as much as anything else, what I think is really important is to not classify it or come up with rules of the road for it, but to figure out how to strengthen it, how to nurture it, how it becomes a, 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 a space that fosters co-creation. Because that's really what we're talking about. Um, when we talk about transdisciplinary, we're specifically talking about the things that we can create together. 
when we're talking about more transactional kinds of collaboration, we're still talking about different types of, of, of co-creation that are within this. And I think one of the enormous challenges that, that, that Roger has identified here is that universities and in general our educational systems aren't exactly designed to be domains for co-creation. They are designed to be places to accomplish very specific, often linear trajectories that have been pre-designed. Pre um, how we deal with that is a pretty big question. But I think that the more that we can uh, kind of approach this from that spirit of fuzzy taxonomy, a space mm -hmm. to co-create, uh, ultimately the more fruitful it will be. So I feel like that was very worldly and now I'm going to be very selfish. Um, <laughs> my name is Owen. I'm a current PhD candidate at Georgetown University in the chemistry department. And I'm curious, we'll generalize, how does one go through this kind of like blossoming educator experience in a way where I can kind of create a path that pushes me towards being a better both STEAM individual and STEAM educator in this very, as we've said, specialized process. Obviously, I need to follow through on NSF grants and please my PI, et cetera, but how can I also create collaborative experiences maybe with an artist or within my university or in outreach, et cetera? Um, yeah, I meet a lot of people like you because <laughs> you, want to, you want to do more than one thing um, and you should be able to. So uh, my advice to you uh, would be um, wear multiple hats, you know, a uh, scientist by day, uh, a performer by night. You know, I, I honestly know scientists who are stand-up comedians and musicians and do outreach and, you know, they're crazy busy, but they love it. That's what they want to be doing. Um, but you do have to carve your own path. You have to seek out opportunities which are maybe a little off the beaten path. Um, my position at Rutgers didn't exist before I got there. It was just very good timing. But there are more and more universities. Like, we're talking about STEAM now because it's a popular thing. Universities want to implement it. They do not know how to do it. So they bring Roger in from France, or they you know, bring me in from New York, uh, because they're, they, a lot of them realize they need to bring in someone new. They can't do it with existing faculty or expect, you know, existing faculty to be able to bear that burden of, of working across, right? So, so look out for those too. Um, and and I, bet, I bet you'll find something. Yeah, and I would also add that um, at the National Academy of Sciences, I'm involved in organizing the DC Art Science Evening Rendezvous program, which is part of the laser network. And we're, we're in DC. And we're bringing artists and scientists together um, around broad themes and we just kind of see where the discussion goes. We would love to have you attend some of those events. We have an open mic at the beginning of every program where anyone in the audience could talk a little bit about their work and their interests and that could be a good way for you to meet people that might be interested in collaborating. Thank you. Actually, I went to Georgetown Chemistry Department, got my master's degree from that, so <laughs> nice uh, connection. Um, I'm in the humanities. I teach uh, philosophy, history, philosophy, also um, science. Um, and the discussion of hybridity um, and also the question of standards is kind of rolling around in my mind, uh, and the humanities part. So basically, I think of... Um, uh, standards, I, they're stultifying, I know. Um, uh, I did some early work with NASA at the birth of the internet, the, just the, <laughs> the dawn of history. Um, and uh, I was lucky enough to get a, T, a T1 connection, which is what universities had many, to my classroom because of a very generous NASA administrator. It was uh, totally luck and uh, connections. Uh, anyway, I saw kids do really great things there that weren't at all science kids, they just wanted to get a web page. That was their entire thing, to be famous for, for uh, the dawn of history, you know. Um, anyway, uh, the mixture of things, to me, the word that stands out um, is metaphor. At that point, 
I did have to do a lot of things with standards. I was teaching high school for a couple of years, and NASA was very into education standards. They were just starting to go up for that. And whether it was mission-based, uh, the race to create the best acronym, which is what NASA does a lot, and or uh, to make something that actually fits the standards so you can get the grants and get the, uh, the connections with the Department of Ed, it never quite worked out. Every one of those is, was not going to, it basically has an issue. Uh, so what I think of as metaphor as sort of the, the, the come to the rescue here. And what I mean by that is that it's sort of a meta standard. And people who can think in terms of metaphor, recognize metaphor, utilize metaphor, manipulate metaphor, are very flexible. And the earlier you do this, the more and better you can do it without actually leaving your field. Um, so for example, um, thinking about dendrites in the brain uh, comes from trees and, you know, the fellow last night, I forget who it was, I was watching this on stream, uh, talked about streams and glass and the whole, st all of that stuff is basically playing with words, but every one of those words, because they're technical words, has an impact. It has an entire set of technologies and ideas that come from that. Um, and having that flexibility just with metaphor, with metaphor thinking, which is poetic and artistic, as well as very technical. It's what we call vocabulary. Uh, biology books are full of, have too many words on. To be able to create metaphor and to recognize it in your own field, I think, is, uh, is a talent that kind of goes above and beyond all the different standards and yet has application to all of them. Not too heavy-handed and yet uh, something worth uh, exploring, uh, which I'd love to hear more about. <laughs> Can I just react to the metaphor thing? So I, I hope someone's doing a word cloud of the words being used by this group of people over three days. Um, I have a PhD student working on applying metaphor theory to data visualization. Why the hell do we make maps of data when the data is 20 dimensional? <laughs> so, you know, visualization, we think in ways that comes from our real world. When you're in the data world, how do you think differently on how to represent the data? And let me tell you that metaphors lock you into excluding all kinds of other ways of thinking about how you represent data. And what are artists at, good at? Representing their experiences, <laughs> among other things. Sharing their experiences with other people. How do you share a data world with other people? And so I think the metaphor theory is a, is a really good uh, sort of instrument for some of this discussion. Sorry, I cut you off. No. Tyler. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> Hi, I'm Kimberly Schwab. I come from science, and I had a passion for history and philosophy of science, but now I teach middle school science. And one of the things I've been concerned about with, with STEAM is this humanities. How does it fit in? Because it's a little bit awkward, and so much of STEAM has been sold, it seems, as like kind of this technology, like art will make you solve problems better. And it does. It is a beautiful thing. But but science is is bigger than that. And I guess one of the things that I've been trying to work with, it, it, this integration of humanities is much more about the questions we ask. I mean, how can we be more creative? Yes, bring in art. But if we want to understand how, how um, science makes a claim about anything, how does the scientific community change their mind through big revolutions or small, that's where um, you can't I mean, I can't talk about, you know, evolution without Darwin and Agassiz and the fight about slavery and the Civil War. I mean, it's just like, if that's the goal, and that, that whole goal of like, how do you change your mind, how do you as an individual change your mind, and how does the scientific community change their mind, that happens to solve other problems too that are really, really important. But I don't... I haven't seen that in a lot of the STEM conversation. So then there's, so there's the questions you ask. Also, in terms of speaking to last night, too, in terms of this relationship between art and science, um, I think of teaching science as an opportunity for students to behold the beauty of the world, not just aesthetically, but the way scientists recognize beauty. And that that's a, like, we want students to appreciate the joy of literature, but like to appreciate the beauty of the earth and also this, this adventure in science that led us to this other type of beauty. And then, so there's the questions you ask and then there's the methodology. And one, th one way I've worked with integrating humanities into the science curriculum, um, and I, I don't see it very much, is, is theater, by actually 
teaching, I mean, one example is teaching a play, informed consent, recent play, um, but teaching genetics and evolution in the context of that play, sitting with the play as we're working through it, and then the kids come away with, I mean, back to the question about what, what do we want them to come away with, one thing I'm just really happy about, and I didn't, I was thinking about teaching genetics and evolution, but what they came away with this very powerful sense of ethics. And that's gone into, you know, sort of like, this is complicated, and this is, which you can't get with a little sidebar in ethics. You kind of have to sit with that for a while. So I guess I'm just wondering why these questions aren't, that I don't see it in STEM literature, like this, this kind of perspective. Maybe I'm just weird, but that's the way I see it. I mean, I love STEM, mm -hmm. I don't like the name, um, but, but this integration with humanities, there's so many more possibilities, and it's not just like a little tack a little history on, it's embedded in the, in the process. So one thing that I always sort of struggle with when I'm teaching is the, is my bias. Um, the idea of how do I take something that's just information, today's temperature, yesterday's temperature, a decade of temperature, and now put it through my filter to make it into data, and then share my data with everybody else so that we can make this knowledge that we're going to use to shape policy or something. It's really hard, because it's hard for me to get rid of my bias without talking to other people about theirs. Um, one thing that's coming to mind, the whole time I heard you talk was I'm working with the Bronxville School District and they were concerned about how many students were pursuing advanced science for a number of reasons, but the outcome was we designed a project that engages every student in their school district from kindergarten through ninth grade in a five-year research project examining the health of the Bronx River and we talked to the students at the beginning and end of every year what is science? What is the work of a scientist? How does science benefit you personally, your community? And the thing that's coming out two years into the project is students are saying, science is about interconnectedness. Science is about how the information that I gather can be used not just for the people in my school because the other students are sharing my information and using it as data, but now we're sharing it at the village level, we're sharing it at the state level, we're talking to other people who have rivers in their communities who want to study it similarly. And to me, that interconnectedness, this gets back to the philosophy and the humanities. I mean, this is sort of why we artists write down their ideas and why people have written novels, it's interconnectedness. I, th I think you're right on. And so the, the question is how we make our implicit biases explicit. Now, obviously, you, you don't want to spend 100% of your time doing that, but everything has an implicit bias, right? So this is a really good thing for putting liquids in. If it's the only tool you got, you're going to study. Studying error, this is the wrong thing. So every scientific method has implicit biases on what can be studied and can't be studied. Sometimes it's, oh, we don't have the math to even create a simulation of it yet, right? And when you get the climate change, there's no equation of climate change. It's a different kind of thing that we need to come up with to explain and study climate change. And so somehow how the humanities get embedded in the way of thinking uh, it is, you know, it's, we've built a society that doesn't do that. <laughs> and yeah, we tag on the ethics on the side. But we don't think what are our implicit biases individually or as a group or as a tool. <laughs> mm -hmm. What does it allow us to study? What does it not allow us to study? What can we understand? What can't we understand? So I, I, th I think you're right on. <laughs> so has anyone here ever heard of the show Mythbusters? Yeah. So uh, for those of you who don't know, um, there was basically two engineers who worked in the film industry and they addressed questions such as would cockroaches actually survive a nuclear war and or did pirates wear a patch over one eye so they could navigate space and the answer was no, cockroaches wouldn't survive and two, actually wearing an eye patch does allow you to walk around at night uh, almost immediately. 
And so you can very intuitively see where this type of integration of steam thinking exists. And Adam Savage, one of the two engineers, one of my favorite quotes from that work that applies um, in my life every day is, the difference between screwing around and science is writing it down. <laughs> um, and so early on in the conversation, people were talking about like what is the core curriculum that we should be promoting in STEAM and basically in education in general, to me is writing things down. And so a lot of people, I, I really enjoy the, the critical mass of moleskins here today, but I think having that culture of writing things down on, on multiple layers, so one being methodical about it, and actually looking back at what you wrote, and that continuity of knowledge, and reintegrating, and redigesting, and reevaluating how to pursue more knowledge um, in the science and the arts uh, might look different, but fundamentally is exactly the same. And so to me, uh, imagining what curriculum would be like from a K through 12 and continuing education format would be you know, distinguishing qualitative and quantitative data. So in the scientific, you know, traditional scientific scenario, you know, this is how you make a bar graph. This is the difference between correlation and causation. This is a p-value versus for an artist, it's appreciating form and line and context. Um, and so in my personal experience, when I was in high school, we had inquiry skills, which was freshman year course. Um, so like, how do we get the data? And then as juniors, we studied theory of knowledge. And so, you know, and I'm now a molecular biologist, and so when you think about long-term training, you learn about the central dogma like five times before you actually apply it. So this idea of you have to reach a certain age of training in order to be methodical in digesting information, um, I think, you know, like, where do we have the time and the space? And I was like, well, we learn all these other principles five times before we do experimental work. So with that in mind, what do you personally think is an essential skill for students to have? Um, so for example, studying, how do you actually structure a lab notebook? How do you actually structure an artistic portfolio? And being able to do both of those things allows you to do the semi-improvised play that is the true nature of STEM thinking. Um, so like in your personal life, like for me, I think for many artists and scientists, the importance of writing things down immediately after you have that thought. Um, so if you guys want to talk about that. Uh, can, I think. Okay, uh, go ahead. I think you just said it. I think it's making your thinking visible. Yeah. Uh. yeah what, what I call this is process documentation, which is so much easier than it used to be. Click. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, how do you document your thinking and show it to other people? Artists do it in one way, uh, scientists do it in a different way. Externalizing your, your thinking processes writing it down, which you know, I'm busy doing with uh, 18th century technology, um, I think is an important skill of how you externalize what you are thinking about or trying to do, share it with other people as a methodology to, to finding solutions. Thank you. Click. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> um. Hello, everybody. Um, I came from Brazil with my two colleagues here, and we work for more than 20 years with bringing science and arts together, especially for education. So that's a subject that interests me and, uh, very much. Sorry for my English. I will make many errors, but I want to pass the two ideas. The first is uh, that I want to ask you about the other experience here in the US about uh, educating educators. Because uh, uh, when we talk for the large mass of, uh, of uh, the education system, the universities or the elementary schools, uh, that is very difficult because it's completely um, already established and, uh, and uh, boxed everything. So uh, to, to, to foster an integrative uh, curriculum, and an interdisciplinary curriculum, and those experiences were difficult. However, when you, you know, when you deal with teachers that will have all their lives, 20 years, 30 years, uh, behind, behind uh, um, to, to work on these subjects, they are extremely avid for uh, changing things. So in our experience, uh, with 20 years, uh, 
uh, giving courses for teachers and educators in all, in all subjects. I came from the, the, health, the health environment. I'm a medical, I, I'm a scientist with uh, developing new medicines for neglected disease. So in my institute, as when we receive the educators, it's just to educate for life, broad, in a broad sense. So uh, the experience of putting, um, of mixing uh, interdisciplinary groups of teachers in a short curriculum of 40, 45 hour uh, course, for instance, change um, very, very strongly their way uh, as they do things in their own uh, professional space. So I would like very much to to share with you uh, other experience like that and uh, how we can challenge, um, how we can solve the challenge of uh, jumping from the small scale practice to a large scale practice in large countries like US, Canada and Brazil, for instance. So that's the question, how to jump. Thank you. I, I can address that a little bit and I, I would say in this country it's a little bit harder in education just because we have standards um, and not that standards are bad but every every state defines those standards differently every school district again defines how the state's defining those standards differently um, if you're an expeditionary school or um, a British primary school, again, you're getting these, these standards that come from the state and then to the school district and then to your educational group. Everybody has their own learning objectives and what we find in the classroom is that these standards and all of this implementation is rather schizophrenic. Um, it doesn't really correlate, it doesn't tie together. It's very hard for teachers every year to be adapting what they're doing um, and be able to achieve these bigger goals. I guess I'd, I'd just expand the teach the teachers to learn to learn. So mm -hmm. it's probably going to take us 50 years to figure out how this stupid thing changes the way we can learn things. We're, we're sort of in the stone age of, of this, the, whatever this is giving me access to. And so, it's, yeah, we need to teach differently, but we need to learn differently. And I think it's going to take us 50 years to figure out how to teach differently, but also how to learn differently. So good morning everyone, um, my name is Nick Church, I'm a scientist um, and I just wanted to say that I thought that, um, that you guys shouldn't be so hard on yourself. Um, so I'm a Brit as you can probably tell and um, I've worked and lived in America for a couple of years previously but now I'm in, in Britain, I've worked in universities in both and in China and I think um, you shouldn't be too hard on the current state of uh, US education. <laughs> I don't know if you know, but in Britain we specialise quite a lot earlier. Um, and this has some, gives us some advantages. But in my experience, um, American students in university, American students in grad school, they have good, broad education. They can see transdiscipline. They're much better informed than British undergraduates beyond their speciality, and I think that's really valuable. The downside is it takes longer to educate them. But I just, you know, I don't really have anything deep or meaningful to say. I just want to say, don't be too negative about the current <laughs> state of, of the US uh, university education, because as far as I can see from having a, a slightly different perspective, it's doing a pretty good job already. It doesn't mean it can't do better, but it's doing a pretty good job. Thank you so much for bringing up the international perspective, because certainly this conversation is not limited to the United States. STEAM is everywhere in various forms. Okay. Uh, so what's next? So um, if you all will bear with us for the next one minute, we are going to have a short artistic visual interlude to this conversation. Um, Cynthia Panucci will make her way over this direction. So you guys on this side of the room, if you want to just do this fun, like rotate your chair around thing, um, points for the person who's most creative about how this is best achieved. I know. <laughs> or you can just turn your body around in the chair. Um, so we're going to hear uh, just for the next 10 minutes or so about um, some of the most impressive and interesting art projects that deal with science that Cynthia has graciously gathered for us. Uh, and then following that, we'll have a coffee break before the next round table. I just want to say to round table participants, um, please make sure that you are back 
here at 1125. Thank you.